Hi, welcome back to the food forest. Today we're actually not in my food forest, we're actually in a friend's food forest. This is a consultation that we did on suburban permaculture. You guys might remember his place from a few years ago. It was a very popular video actually on suburban permaculture. And we're back at Tom's place. So, you know, name uh, change to protect the innocent. So Tom's backyard is roughly 18 feet wide by 50 feet. So it's a fairly standard, typical suburban backyard. And then along the side of the houses, it goes down to about uh, eight feet and then six feet right up against the house. In this space, we fit in somewhere around 11 to 12 trees. And then roughly it's like a three to one ratio for bushes to trees. So he probably has somewhere around, you know, 20 to 30 bushes. And then we've crammed the place full of pollinators to help benefit the local ecosystem. So let's go on a tour. We'll show you his backyard. We'll show you what's growing. And uh, yeah, let's get going. So here's the entrance to the house. There's some ivy on the ground uh, that was here before. Same with the hostas. We added in the Jerusalem artichokes here, which might seem like a bit of a strange place for the artichokes, but we wanted to put it somewhere that it wouldn't necessarily creep out and take over the whole backyard. And um, he could kind of see if he likes it and wants it. And then it would also get up over the fence and get sun. So it's a, kind of a pretty good spot for them. You can see sometimes they'll try to creep out and, and get more of the pathway. So they'll require a bit of management at the side of the house. And in general, if you are doing a permaculture backyard in a small space, you're going to be looking at a little bit of management in order to keep everything kind of tame. One thing that he thought was really funny and enjoyed is that he's got kale coming up as his weeds. So his weeds are actually uh, kale plants, which is kind of nice. We'll just kind of do a quick little walk through and then what I'll do is I'll come back and then show the entire place. So we've got a central island guild here, two main walking paths on each side of this. And then we come back into here and then we've got a couple little guilds. We've got a little guild here with a walking path, a guild to the back and one in the center here. and then wrapping around the house. And they've got this beautiful patio to sit and enjoy it. I'm trying to not film the house too much because they do enjoy their privacy and want to make sure they keep it. So here's the, probably my favorite place coming right off of the patio here and then into two different sections of a food forest walking around the side here or down there. Okay, so let's pop back over and we'll go through some of the plants. Now one thing I should mention about this project was the overall planting strategy. So for any of the consultations I gave a questionnaire and really sit down for a good you know, couple hours going through what are the goals for the property, what kind of aesthetic do the clients like and all that. So the goal of the design of this project was a true wild backyard, something that benefited nature as much or more than benefited the human. So in this project, for example, you're not gonna see very much hardscaping, walking path, edges to gardens. It really was supposed to be habitat for nature. Additionally, because of the small space and the uh, sheer ridiculous amount of food that Tom wanted us to design into the property, it was funny, I always had to kind of constantly rein him back on, okay, well, you know, we do have to be aware of how much space we have. So one of the goals for this project was to overplant and then select the favorite species, fully understanding that we would have to simplify the design down the road. Right now we're in year three of this project and it's definitely becoming evident that this is the time of uh, management, picking winners and losers, and kind of stewarding the project into what the final design is going to look like down the road. So right now I just did a quick walk around of the project. Right now we're in July so this is like full rampant season. Things are just taking off. All the herbaceous layer stuff will grow up over the perennial longer lived species like trees. So even in my property I have to do a little bit of management this time of season to make sure that the perennial aspects, the trees and the bushes are getting the sun that they need to get up over 
the herbaceous layer plants. So this is something that's going to be a big focus for this summer, making sure that all the you know beloved trees are getting what they need and you know maybe cutting back the perennials and the pollinator plants a little bit just to expose light to some of the other plants in there. But remember anytime you're planting something in your gardens if you don't cram the spaces nature will. So as much as we have a very full vibrant robust garden here it's full of beneficial plants and that way we can actually sacrifice some of those in order to open the light instead of having open spaces and then dealing with weeds constantly and then having maybe pernicious invasive plants take over and be very difficult to control. Okay, so we'll kind of reset back to the beginning of the project here. We've got the Jerusalem artichokes and we've got a mulberry uh, right next to it here, growing right on the fence line. And then we've got some sumac. So this is staghorn sumac growing here. I believe this was actually a volunteer plant. And we've got, uh, so we've got raspberries and asparagus guild here on the side. These are red raspberries and yellow raspberries. In fact, like even the ones here, like look at this leaf. I actually couldn't even believe when I saw this leaf. I've never seen raspberries that look like this. This is actually a raspberry plant. And look at this. Isn't it funny how you just see the most beautiful things when you get outside sometimes? A bee enjoying these flowers. Really, really nice ornamental uh, raspberry plant here with this yellow raspberry. Now the raspberries will do what raspberries do and they want to live everywhere so they were kind of growing up and under so now he's actually got two plants of raspberries he's got two beds he's got one here as well that uh, now he's kind of doubled his raspberries and just kind of mows over the clover so in discussing about this consultation follow-up he hadn't had any of this clover cut because he was enjoying giving it to the bees so we actually did just make a little walking path through here just for today Right here we've got a gigantic plum. This thing started out maybe about five feet tall and it's now pushing close to 12 or 15 feet. Uh, still no fruit on this, no flowers yet. Kind of like my plum, I just did a video on my plum and we're experiencing the same thing. I think plums maybe just take a little bit longer to grow, uh, but you can already see it's beginning to train out some of these branches to go and occupy spaces along the fence to kind of take advantage of as much real estate as possible in a uh, smaller backyard space. And in fact, um, espalier was a big part of this plan. The rabbits got in the way of the, of the plan a little bit, but you can see we've got these cages growing up here with the kiwi growing up the side and really want to use as much of uh, the space as possible. So really using the fences is super important. Okay, so this back area here, we actually plan to espalier on right up against the fence and use this back fence as much as possible. So this was some pears and some apples, and the rabbits actually had different ideas for what we would do here. So they've been eating some of these here. So you can see he's uh, tried to replace them over the years to put another one in, and they just keep getting at them. And these are kind of growing out from the, from the rootstock. The graft would have been up here. So all of these are going to be rootstock apples and because of that you can see he's just kind of letting them grow but not taking you know extra care to try to save any of them because uh, they're just going to end up possibly being junk apples. You can see over here we've got an apple that he did manage to save from the rabbit so he's got the protective cage around and one here as well. So we should get a, cup, a couple of them anyways that we can hopefully get up growing across the fence. Okay, so this here is the middle guild with the pathways on either side, kind of an island guild. This was intended to be areas where we would put plants that wanted to sprawl a bit because we could be mowing on either side and contain these in an area. Um, it also areas that we could put possibly put some more thorny plants because you can kind of keep them down. So we've actually got some gooseberries in here and so the gooseberries are all loaded up, kind of hiding in there. We've got some goldenrod uh, for a pollinator tractor. We've got a spotted Joe pieweed here as well. So we've got a lot of pollinators in here and we've got a grasshopper just chilling, hanging out. So grasshoppers will eat leaves. This is a good reason, especially in urban settings or suburban settings, it's a good reason to include dense vegetation because he's just hanging out there on a spot of Joe pieweed 
instead of you know if you didn't have that and you just had apple trees for example that thing would defoliate your apple trees pretty quick so all the more reason to plant tons of diversity we've got more gooseberries kind of sneaking their way up through here we've got more goldenrod here okay, and then we got some blackberries here so this is a thornless blackberry and we put it in the middle because we wanted to just contain where it is we could kind of fence up around it and then maybe even one day put it like a trellis and have it act as an archway to walk underneath but definitely something that we're well aware we have to monitor uh, carefully and make sure that it's it behaves itself we've got some asters here and we've got some um, daylilies and we've got some butterfly milkweed so definitely a huge uh, push to try to get butterflies into the backyard and then coming out we got some more spotted joe pieweed uh, and then ending right here we've got uh, garlic growing up so we've got some scapes we're in scape season here and then this is a pear um, Tom wanted a really sweet pear so he went with something called a dewdrop pear so we'll see this is supposed to be absolutely incredible I hear they don't store very long but that's probably not a problem if you're eating them right away which I don't think is going to be a problem here and this entire walkway is just Dutch white clover so every single time we mow or cut then we've got this huge flush of nitrogen and uh, free biomass basically from the actual leaves we definitely have to be careful because um, it is very much a happy bee food plant but this is why we planted this for sure so we've got a functional ecosystem ground cover that keeps the weeds suppressed and also provides food for all the plants around it okay coming back around to the back side of that island guild we've got a mulberry here on the back fence so this is an area where we're on the north side here and we can actually get a nice big tall tree the tallest biggest tree that we have is going to be this mulberry uh, anytime you're planting mulberry you have to be really careful because it will drop uh, fruit that can stain cars or anything that's underneath it so we wanted to make sure this was planted in a proper place that wouldn't uh, you know have any kind of negative impacts like that and then we've got a nice little pollinator guild here with some of our favorite plants like yarrow and we've got more spotted joe pieweed which is just such an underrated plant as well and then on the back here we've got more espalier Okay, so we find ourselves now at the patio, which is the main entertainment space. You can see some rainwater catchment and harvesting up there. We've got this really nice arbor. So we thought growing some grapes up the arbor would be fantastic. We've got some uh, raspberry in here, some hazelnuts, and some highbush cranberry in the back. This is his compost setup here. And then we've got grapes up every single one of these trellises here. And then we've also got right at the exit of the house there's a couple kitchen gardens here where they can plant annuals as well another way that you can get a lot of space in a smaller area is actually planting right next to hardscaping so we've got this patio here but it's elevated so that means we can actually squeeze some of these trees fairly close you wouldn't want to plant a tree for example this close to a patio if the patio was at ground level because the tree roots might kind of push into it pop up the patio stones and be a little annoying like that but here we can actually plant fairly close to these garden beds this is on the north side of the garden bed so for light for the annual gardens we can prune this up and then once it gets over uh, the light that's hitting these isn't going to shade out anything on the north side of it besides the blackberry which has no problem dealing with a little bit of shade so we're kind of trying to take into account that kind of level of sun thinking we can prune this up so we can get underneath and walk over it and we can train some of these branches right over top so that we're picking um, chums this is a cherry plum hybrid so this is a cherry plum cross I mean and uh, this here is right next to some cherry bushes so this is in the Romeo series of cherries so we're getting good pollination going right across in here as well and then we come into a nectarine and this is a uh, a uh, really nice nectarine here it's doing really really well growing in this area and then it's surrounded with goldenrod so nectarines in this area can have a little bit of an issue with pests but growing pollinator plants right up through the canopy so I've mentioned in many of my videos before imagine that you're a pest hanging out on this underside of this leaf but then you've got 
uh, predators that are attracted to the goldenrod that are growing right next to you. So this is a way that you can kind of give predators ambush spots to attack the predators by growing things right up into the canopy of trees. And then you also get the added benefit of having all the wonderful insects in your ecosystem plantings and they actually are functional for you as well. Here we're actually on the north side of a giant black locust and Tom had actually cut back a lot of this to release light. However, it does provide a little bit of shade and this is where we wanted to put our shade plants. So shade loving things like pawpaw. So at the side of the house, we're using all the space again and we've got some existing plants that were here before, a little bit of hostas, added a little bit of comfrey because it's always good to stick some uh, great uh, fertilizer food anywhere that you can. We've got this a little bit, it's a little thorny. This is kind of a bit of a pain this uh, raspberry but this is actually the family's favorite fruit it is so good these black raspberries are a little smaller but honestly they're just absolutely incredible oh they just like explode in your mouth so much flavor so sweet so we've also squeezed in some um, fiddlehead ferns ostrich ferns into here we've also got some grapes growing up the fence here that he's kind of training all along the fence. And then sneaking in asparagus anywhere we can. Always good to have asparagus. You're always gonna to want to have planted asparagus 20 years ago. So it's always a good idea if you have asparagus, or if you have room, sorry, squeeze asparagus in there. You won't be sorry about it. We've got some hazelnuts here as a butterfly flutters around us. We've got some high bush cranberry here. Another hazelnut for, you want to keep these things close together for pollination. And then we've got another cranberry for pollination here. And we've got some lemon balm all growing around it for the bees. So thanks for watching. Thanks for watching our little urban permaculture tour. I have to say I was here during the initial filming of the tour and I've snuck in some of that early footage. I have to say being in here now, even though it should feel like everything's closed in and there's less area to live in, it actually feels much bigger. Actually, this backyard feels like you can actually get lost in it, which is kind of remarkable um, to have a fairly small suburban backyard that feels like you're in a forest and you could actually just walk out here and get lost for hours, enjoying all the insects and the animal life that's brought in, all the birds from the windows, and it's just, I think, fantastic. So if you like this, you know, you don't have to go wild like this. There's the other option of the last permaculture uh, consultation that I showed where it's more ordered and, uh, you know, uh, lots of raised bed gardens, lots of hardscape. But this to me is what it is all about. This is just so beautiful. I love it. And we're gonna actually go in now and cook some dinner with some of the food that we're growing here. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.